this week on the Back Table Podcast. So you've made your pass. You think you're in the portal vein. Before you hook up the contrast and try and aspirate, you just take some saline. If you do contrast, you start getting blobs of contrast everywhere. So you just do saline. Just make sure that you can flush forward just a little bit with saline and then hook up your your um, 10 cc contrast mm-hmm. syringe and start backing up while you're while you're aspirating, while you're aspirating. Until you get, right until you get because otherwise you may be aspirating and not getting anything and and the, and the needle is plugged and that that may be an advantage to the Yoshida. So I'm yeah, ask. Yeah, sorry, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the Yoshida, it's usually just one pass, so you don't have to do flushing and <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Maybe that's just an operator thing. Maybe, that's just, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's you. I know, right? I mean, I, I, you know, you guys should understand. I mean, just for full disclosure here, that I'm kind of old school in a, in a few ways. Like, you know, I, I drive a 44 year old car, and and uh, I like my tip set about as old. So. <laughs> <laughs> Table Podcast, your source for all things IR. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, our app, or Spotify. This is Michael Barraza returning as your host. Today's episode is sponsored by RadPad. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, providing clinically proven radiation protection during CINI and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information. And contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And let them know you heard about it on the Back Table podcast. I'm honored to welcome back two guests who've enlightened us before on previous episodes of the Back Table podcast, Dr. Peter Bream from the University of North Carolina and Dr. Peter Horner from Interventional Radiology of Colorado and Denver. The Peters are joining us from 1,600 miles apart and two hours time difference. Huge thanks to both of you for joining us. You're welcome. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, before we kick things off, uh, you know, just a question I had for you. You know, we're talking about tips today, which, you know, as we know, can be some longer cases. Do you guys do anything special for radiation protection other than, you know, glasses and, and lead aprons? I wear booties. <laughs> booties? <laughs> yeah, you got to make sure that you have booties because you're going to get blood all over your feet. That's a good point, Pete. I totally agree with that. Not and me. uh <laughs> <laughs> I definitely use the shield. Uh my techs know to prep the shield on every case. So I need to get better at using the shield. Uh you know, we got the little skirts at the bottom, but uh, you know, that's one of the things I need to work on. You know, my, my second year out in practice, I've, I've had some hefty doses over these first couple of years. Well, one of the best things about um uh IR is the way that uh, different people practice at different uh, institutions and different um, private practice first is um, academic. And I think we'll see a little bit of that tonight in our podcast. But, um, you know, I've recently moved uh, uh, institutions and we were really good about putting the leaded shield, uh, you know, prepping it out. We used Phillips equipment um, at my previous institution and there was a um, remote control and it allowed you to, you know, uh, see them go back and see still images um, and, 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 you know, go back and see previous runs. And that was attached to the shield. So there was an incentive to have that shield right there in front of your face. I thought that was a really good way to remind you to use the, the shield. Uh, and in my current practice, we're using Siemens equipment. There's no uh, remote control and there's not a whole lot of incentive. And to be quite honest with you, I, I forget. And uh, but I really need to be better about bringing that uh, that extra shield in uh, to really get the scatter off the patient. That's what that's for. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right, Pete. Uh, you know, we have a Phyllis machine and we use that remote as well. And it's on our uh, shield. So we got to have it. So it's a nice reminder. I love that. Actually, so how got- many of you, how many have you thrown away? <laughs> not personally <laughs> well that was a that was a con those things cost about twelve hundred dollars a piece and there no was probably way. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then there was, you know, probably once a quarter when somebody would have to go um, dumpster diving to go find the remote that they, <laughs> that was on the table and just kind of cleared up and threw it away. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, I actually got my my rad pad no brainer protection caps in the mail last week. They're actually going to come in and do an evaluation at Centennial for us. But uh, I'd encourage you guys to do the same. Um, so we're going to talk nice. about tips today, and you know it's obviously an expansive topic. Uh, so I'll try to focus on some of the more practical elements and skip over some of the basics. Uh, but I'm definitely looking forward to you know as Peter said, well, I'm, I'm going to call you McBreamy so we can distinguish the two of you. Uh, <laughs> McBreamy said, you know, you learn different ways to do different things at different institutions. So it'll be uh, interesting to hear how you guys are doing this. Uh, but I'd like to start maybe by having you each tell us, you know, what your tips practice looks like. You know, for me, uh, they seem to come in waves, but overall, I'm, I'm mostly treating patients with acute or recent variceal bleeding. It's really been harder. I've had to really go out and get the ones where, with refractory ascites, and usually after like a dozen paras. Um, why don't you start, McBreamy? Tell us, you know, when you're mainly, you know, what you're mainly doing these for and, and where you're getting most of your patients. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how far we're going to go into alternatives to tips, but, oh, I, um, yeah. but I know yeah. that, uh, you know, BRTOs have become a huge part of our practice and cases where we might've done tips in the past, we're now doing BRTOs. So really? we can mm-hmm. throw, yeah, so we can, we can throw that in as well. Um, you know, we're a transplant center at UNC. Uh, so we have a large uh, liver failure population and large cirrhosis population. We work very closely with uh, the hepatologists and the um, transplant surgeons here, and that's where most of our patients come from. Um, we do a fair amount of tips for both of the main indications uh, for ascites and for um, uh, uh, ascites and for uh, variceal bleeding. Mainly soft gel variceal bleeding that's refractory to um, uh, GI management, uh, but also for gastric varices as well. Although it's not as as robust, we usually end up doing a uh, an anagrade um, obliteration of the varices with along with the tips uh, if we're going to be doing if if we're dealing with gastric varices that do not have a splenorenal shunt. Um, but yeah, most so. Um, you know, I, in my previous practice, uh, we rarely ever did a emergent tips in the middle of the night. So I'm, I'll be interested to hear, um, you know, Peter's experience and maybe yours, Mike's as well. Um, we had a pretty strong, um, former colleague that, that felt like the mortality on those were so high that, uh, you, you needed to, to get the patient, stabilized, maybe put in a Minnesota tube or a Blakemore tube, uh, transfuse them, do the full workup with the uh, echo, uh, looking at the right heart, and um, and making sure that it, the tips is going to be safe um, rather than just barrel in there with somebody that's bleeding out in the middle of the night. Right. So, um, uh, you know, I, I have learned that uh, there are some um, attendings in my practice now that will barrel in at two o'clock in the morning and do it. Uh, <laughs> and I had much to my chagrin, <laughs> but uh, I have not had that face here. I'm, that's my wooden table that I'm knocking on. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I feel pretty strongly about that as well. And we'll try and do whatever I can to stabilize the yeah. patient before sending them into the depths of IR to um, exsanguinate. What about you, Western Peter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, th- that's good, Pete. Thanks for sharing those. Um, we're a private practice, and we've got a kind of a, a different situation than you do. My scenario is more uh, community-based hospitals, and we've got some big ones and some smaller ones. So it really depends on where we are and uh, the indications, because some of the some of the more ascites, uh, refractory ascites cases, I could do at one hospital where there's a big uh, sort of liver, you know, population. In terms of uh, non-alcoholic seattle hepatitis, cirrhosis, uh, or your your cryptogenics, um, and then you've got your sort of peripheral, you know, uh, folks that in the smaller hospitals sometimes uh, you know, very high acuity um, alcoholic livers with the variceal hemorrhages and whatnot. So we have a very kind of dynamic uh, 
varied praxis depending on where I happen to be and where the call is coming from. We try not to, you know, tips in the middle of the night either. Uh, I don't think anyone likes to do that, but I think it does come up sometimes when all other, uh, you know, sort of situations have been and uh, options have been, uh, you know, exhausted. So, so for us, um, again, it really depends on uh, where we are. Um, mm-hmm. And it's fun being in a private practice. I don't know, Michael, what your experience is, but um, each place is different. And each place, even though we, we try to standardize our equipment, <laughs> each place is going to have a completely, you know, different, uh, in some ways, uh, set up and experience with technologists and whatnot, which is kind of a bigger issue I'll try to touch on later. No, I think it is a big issue, and it's really affected how and where I do these. I mean, I personally have, you know, I'm privileged at, I'm privileged to do tips at, I believe, nine hospitals in the region. And uh, yeah. some of these hospitals are just not prepared for that. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, right. I, I learned a hard lesson early on where, you know, I got a, I got a call at one of these an- ancillary hospitals asking me to do a tips uh, and you know, they, they insisted that I do it there. They had one tip set. They didn't have, you know, any backup equipment The the techs had probably seen like one or two of these. And so what I ended up doing was, uh, I, I transferred the patient to myself at a different hospital where I have techs that are much better at these. And the, I got an angry call from somebody in the administration, <laughs> like you're sending these patients out. Like, you know, they're, they're worried when I can pay for this. And, you know, they were demanding that this patient, and actually I forgot to, to share the step. This patient was getting sent from another hospital to this one to get the tips. And so instead of sending them there, I said, no, just send it to this other hospital and do it there. Uh, <laughs> they were insisting on having this done there. Well, of course I worked the patient up when I get them to my own hospital after the angry phone calls and the patient was a terrible candidate for tips and was a perfect candidate for a Berto. So I did the Berto, yeah. which I couldn't have right. done at this hospital. So now uh, I really, of all those nine hospitals, will only do tips at two or three of them. And yeah. so I just ship them to wherever I'm going to go. That They're all the same hospital system, and uh, and I'm good with that. That certainly helps. Uh, I, I agree. And P- Pete kind of touched on this earlier. I've myself and my colleagues in my practice have switched to a almost like a BRTO first um, you know, sort of approach to hemorrhage. So, you know, if they've got a, especially gastric varices, you know, if they, if you've got a big shunt, we'll BRTO first. I mean, we don't even kind of talk about tips. Um, I, I really think that that approach has been very helpful in our practice. And that's been pretty cool getting to share that with some of the GI docs and and uh, which some of them are, you know, again, smaller community hospitals, sometimes they're not aware of the other options out there besides tips. And so uh, there have been a lot of times where I've left uh, articles from the Japanese literature, you know, <laughs> on, on, in the ICU, <laughs> in the right. chart, you know what I mean? It's for, Ab- for the other yeah. docs. Well, so are you guys approaching BRTO like the Japanese do, or are you doing it strictly for, you know, gastric varices in the, the setting of a spinal shine? I would say mainly for us, um, if they have a spleen renal shunt, we're doing exactly what Peter said, with, which is uh, we're, we're considering a, uh, a sclerosing type of uh, procedure uh, to start with. And, and I think that as we, you know, there's the two camps. There's the Western camp of um, diversion and or decompression. And then you have the Eastern camp, mainly the Japanese and the Asian um, that that have the sclerosant um, or the obliteration side, and I, you know, as I've thought about this over the years, I start to think of these gastric varices being very similar to um, an you know an arterial venous malformation, where okay. you, if you do not get rid of the actual varics, then it's going to you know let's say you just coil a couple of the inflows, um, it will recruit other other uh, vessels. There's so many vessels in this area that could, could be potentially recruited. And um, if you, you know, if you can't get directly into the varics and, uh, or at least reflux sclerosis up into the varics, then you're not really, you may be treating it now, but you're not treating it down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Peter probably uh, has, has occurred, you know, that has a, occurred as well. Right. I, I remember doing this 15 years ago when we we really weren't considering doing anything like that. And tips was first the tips, and then the second was coiling all the varices, and it was a six hour procedure. Yeah, 
Um, and you, you know, one of my, um, I don't know if we'll probably get into techniques later. Um, but one thing I've noticed, um, from some of my colleagues and some of the fellows this year is, uh, not doing that final run of the tips where you put the catheter all the way out to the splenic vein and get a good image of the entire splenic vein from the splenic hilum all the way to the tips uh, to identify any uh, short gastrics or any feeders that are uh, feeding any types of varices that you may not even do anything about now, but you'll know about them in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you do that, Peter? Do you, is your final run or are you just, you know, I think a lot of people forget because it's just been such a long, hard road. <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, I think for me, it depends on the there, scenario but... and how badly the guy was bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> and how, on, how many it sticks it took. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. It depends on what if the techs are completely bored and they're you know tired and ready to go home. Uh, yeah. No, but uh, no, but I, I do. I usually do a run, final run from the splenic, um, as you say. Because if I can, if I remember, uh, I, I like seeing those and knowing where those are. Well, just one last question about that BRTO. Are you guys strictly doing them for gastric varices, or are you are you occasionally doing them for patients with esophageal varices? My, mine are usually for for gastric varices. I, mean, I just don't see the splenorrheal shunting in the esophageal camp. I really don't. I don't know if if you're different, Pete, but I mean, I no, look no, for it, but I don't see it. I never have. I'm just curious. It's just a different. No, no. I, I the anatomy is a little bit different with that, mm -hmm. um, with the coronary vein, left gastric vein versus the short gastrics, right? Um, causing the splenorenal shunt. Um, I've done it before for small bowel varices, so that's the other. Um, uh, the, you know, you can have mm -hmm. another route where it's going up through the duodenum, and actually, I've done a more of an anterograde. Um, uh, uh, more of an integrate approach um, to those and actually trying to, you know, sclerose the, the varics mm -hmm. that may be in the duodenum. I've only had to do that a couple of times though. That's, that's kind of unusual. Yeah. And we're going to get totally derailed here, Michael. I'm so sorry. But, <laughs> no, I'm good but, with no, no, that's... but I've, you know, I've had a couple of patients over the last year where they've had stomal varices um, yes. and where they're very high functioning people did not want any kind of risk of HE. Right. And hepatic encephalopathy. So we actually did transhepatic portal vein access, and then went down to the varices and sclerosum, just like a you know like a BRTO, but I don't know anagrid, uh <laughs> you know, uh, a stomal variceal embolization or whatever you want to call it. But and, oh, I, and yeah, those that's... those have worked really really well so far. Yeah, so I've got I... them out about a year now. Yeah, I've um, I've done a t I did a ton of those at my previous institution. Yeah, I remember. Um, where we <laughs> we would either stick them directly or we would go transhepatic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we uh, and I can tell you that my practice has varied on that. When I first started doing those, we were just coiling, mm -hmm. and then uh, as I got more facile with sotradecol, mm -hmm. um, I was doing more obliteration. And um, I can't, I can't tell you whether or not I didn't follow anybody or anything like. That. I can't tell you which is better. Um, I can tell you though that just blocking the 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 portal venous flow and getting you know getting that main channel that's coming from the portal vein um is dramatic for these patients like mm -hmm. you said they're highly functioning patients they've unfortunately you know had their peritoneum disrupted so they have a a way for this to create um this varix on the uh in their stoma mm -hmm. and it can be devastating they can just bleed like crazy Yep. And uh, it's a really good, uh, I agree with you. That's a, that's something that all IRs need to have in their armamentarium and not be afraid to go after. Yeah. Absolutely. Or for the less high functioning patients, you know, uh, Peter Horner's special, the Denver shunt, the hometown <laughs> shunt. <laughs> yeah. That's right. My hometown shunt. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I like that. Ask for that. Yeah. Hometown shunt. That's what it is. <laughs> so back, back to tips. I think, I think we can skip over indications for tips Let's talk about the workup, you know, maybe starting with elective tips where you have the luxury of time to, to really get what you want. Um, so, you know, let's say the patient is in your office for the first time, you know, cirrhosis with refractory ascites, but nothing else to work with other than like a full slate of that. I mean, of labs, like no imaging, no known cardiac history. Can you walk me through how you determine if your patients are a candidate for tips? You want to take this one, Pete? Um, sure. So, sure. Uh, Pete. I, sure, Pete. I am. Uh, I am um, uh, very fortunate in that I do have uh, some 
great dedicated clinical time now or, or clinic time with a beautiful new clinic in the, in my uh, operation. And, uh, we, I will say that most of my patients come pretty worked up. Um, they, mm-hmm. I don't have to do much once, once I see them in clinic, there's not a whole lot of test to order. There's not a whole lot of things to be doing. Uh, I get them, like I said, I get, I get them from hepatologists who have, you know, they have a pretty good algorithm and they've already worked these patients up. Um, I do like the opportunity to talk to these patients and sit them down, draw pictures, uh, it is a very hard concept mm-hmm. for patients to understand and taking the time to draw a picture, explain to them what you're trying to do. You're offloading the pressure of this blood flow that can't get back to their heart any other way and um, uh, and doing that. So, you know, there's a checklist we look at. Uh, have they had a right, uh, you know, echocardiogram? Is there, are they in right heart failure? So no known cardiac issues or pulmonary hypertension in an elective TIPS patient, do you require an EKG or an echo if they don't have any known cardiac history? Yes, I would, okay. I would get an echo before I'm, I'm going to uh, do a TIPS. Western Peter? Yes, for sure. I agree. Okay. We do. I, I think that's just too easy to do. It's too ubiquitous of an exam, and it can uncover things that uh, people, where, where people are asymptomatic. What about right. imaging? Uh, I, mm-hmm. You know, if I can get it, I love a CT before it tips. Oh, absolutely, I, I, absolutely. Um, we had a tips recently that failed, um, uh, where the, the the veins were just really, really uh, um, parallel. They were they came yeah. off at, at ninety degree angle. They were small, but. Uh, and they tried for several hours to get this. It, the, one of the one of the hepatic veins, the the main right hepatic vein was an accessory right hepatic vein, which oh. actually came off below the level of the portal vein. Mm. So there was no way to stick. That is brutal. Oh, it that's, was brutal. That's unfair. It, it is. It is. <laughs> but but you know what? Um, if you carefully looked at the MRI, there was actually a juicy middle hepatic vein which came off of the left. Mm-hmm. And they never interrogated the left to see if one you could try it from the left, or or if they could find this this vein, which is uh, was you know the best one. So I absolutely, um, I mean, one you need to know if the portal vein is patent because you're going to do sure. other things that are very you know different if that's not the case. Um, and two, uh, I plan the entire case out of my head before I go in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I have a plan. Right, exactly. I mean, you can use the you know the osseous landmarks on the CT to really help you kind of know where your you know your candle right. is going to be and all those things. Um, Surgical clips from gallbladders. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's sort of oh, my favorite. Um, yes. <laughs> so. aim, aim an inch left to the clip and go. <laughs> I, I had one uh, two weeks ago with a uh, biliary stent, and it was the greatest oh, landmark I've ever had. Nice. It's amazing. Uh, so talking about uh, you know. Um, elective tips, say for societies or anything else like that. Do you guys have an age cutoff? That's something that's come mm-hmm. up for me recently. It's like, ugh, you know, because I mean, I know literature says age greater than 65 is a known risk factor for encephalopathy after tips, but, you know, a healthy 68 year old with bad ascites, I don't know. I, I didn't really have an answer. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I've been referred somebody who the, the hepatologist felt was, um, w- would be too old for a too old. In other words, they they wouldn't refer them if they felt if their if their functional status was so low. Okay. Um. So I haven't had that problem. I don't know, Peter. Have you? I haven't had that, but uh, I mean, I think the oldest I've done is eighty. Um. And uh, yeah, I mean, encephalopathy is an issue with those older people, for sure. If you look at the you know meta analysis like Salerno and et cetera, all those from like in the two thousands. You know, you'll see that, you know, age over 60, I think, is known to be an independent risk factor for worse HE. So, um, it's certainly, yeah, but I, I, I don't think, think so, today's you know? 60 year I don't think today's I know, right? 60 year olds are the same <laughs> no, as I, I 20 mean, years ago. I really I don't. Peter, I, I, did, I did 84. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was going to say 80, 83, I think, was the old. <laughs> and the lady did, I mean, she was really, really young, 84. Um, yeah. <laughs> but she did, she did fine. And I just kind of counseled her on, increased risk. Uh, I mean, she had had a pretty bad bleed and she was going to bleed again. And so it was pretty straightforward. 
Um, but what about, you know, for patients, you know, with mild intermittent encephalopathy, like how do you approach those patients? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess for ascites, it's, it's more complicated, but, uh, you know, for bleeding risk, uh, that, that just seems like a challenge. Yeah, totally. Think, yeah. I think it's definitely a challenge. I think it just, this is, this is the opportunity during your clinic, um, appointment to talk about this, these things and talk about the risks, um, and then weigh the risk benefit ratio from, weekly paras or weekly thoras, um, and, uh, risking, you know, because you can always reverse the tips. You can always occlude it. You can narrow it. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, you just have to have a frank discussion with the referring clinician and the patient and talk about these things so that you can, you know, if they, if they do occur that you, you have a plan B. Uh, just a couple more questions regarding the workup. One, uh, you know, I see uh, every now and then somebody with, you know, coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia. And, you know, I know what our SIR guidelines say about, you know, correcting and not doing it, you know, above or below a certain number. Um, but a lot of these patients just have like chronic coagulopathy. How do you guys approach that? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, I th- I think uh, certainly if you're in the heat of the moment, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, we prefer not to do the middle of the night tips for sure. But, you know, they do happen. Even the middle of the night tips happens during the day too. every once in a while. This is true. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, like guns are blazing, right? <laughs> Barreling in. Yeah, uh, it, it does. Well, they come happen. and they're coming from the cat uh, from the GI lab, <laughs> exactly. That, where they exactly. picked the scab, and now they're. they're I guess like, so. oh. we've had mine coming with. We've had a rash of those recently, and it just, I know. It yeah, made me sweat. Right, right. I mean, because you know, you want your INR and your platelets to be you know tuned up as best you can. I mean, certainly given some platelets, you know, before or during the procedure is fine if they're on the low side or even some FFP, but. Um, I think, honestly, I think the uh, advent of using ice catheter, uh, you know, in reducing the number of sticks uh, and passes with your needle uh, is super important, especially in those coagulopathic patients, you know. Um, gone are the days, I think, when you have to, like, you know, just stick until you get the portal vein. I mean, because that's where you might get into trouble, right? Correct. So. No comment. Uh, what is, what's the number you use for platelets, Peter, before you'll uh, do a platelet transfusion? Oh, you know, usually it's around 50. Okay. Yeah, I usually use 40. Um, All right, 35. All I'm right, 30. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe in platelets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in platelets. <laughs> so, I mean, do you guys think there's any, any role for kind of the um, – the borderline patients for doing transjugular wedge pressure measurements like prior to setting them up for an actual tips. Well, I measure pressures before on every case. So Are you, Oh, absolutely. Okay. And cause I've been in a situation actually when I was in training in Oregon, uh, where we had a patient, it was, it was actually a young patient, um, who had a society refractory ascites. And we kind of went in, you know, we had the clinic consult, all this stuff. Right. And we had the workup, and we got in and did the tra- the pressures and there was no gradient really, you know, it was a normal gradient. So we had to just back out, you know? And so, I mean, it's not, not great to put a patient through a procedure, but at the same time, uh, you, you know, you can always, <laughs> before the needle is thrown, uh, you know, you've got some, you know, some time to back out and really think about it. I think, th- I think tips is really, you know, an exercise in physio and physiology and hemodynamics, right? Absolutely. I mean, we, we really have to be, constantly evaluating this during the procedure and not just having a preset notion of, yes, this is what I'm going to do, et cetera. I, th- I think it's like a, can be kind of a dynamic situation that you find yourself in and you have to be willing to back out and sort of change plans. You know, if you're, if the data is not supporting your hypothesis. So I have, I have a, a little bit different take on that. I, I don't do uh, like a transjugular pressure or a wedge pressure before I would start a tips, but I, I, cause I, I feel like, um, you need a direct measurement. You need a direct portosystemic gradient yeah. and mm-hmm. especially with a wedge catheter. So I, I, you know, one of the other topics that uh, we were going to talk about at one point was transgender liver biopsies, which I think is a whole, t- you know, it's a whole topic in itself. Mm-hmm. And, um, after reading the literature, I changed my practice, um, probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, to u- using exclusively using balloon catheters for mm-hmm. um, 
uh, for measuring those pressures. And it came from an article that said that, you know, fibrosis and cirrhosis can be, um, can be seg- uh, segmental and mm-hmm. you can drop a catheter into a completely normal part of the liver and get that one wedge pressure from that one little area and, and miss hypertension. Whereas if mm-hmm. you put the balloon in there and, and get a larger segment, uh, you have less sampling error. So I, I, I would, um, uh, I, I feel like you, you get in, you get your pressures, and then at that point, you only have a five French catheter across the parenchyma. Yeah. You can always, you can always stop at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do use balloon wedging, you know, balloon catheter for wedging. So I don't know. Well, you're a smart guy. <laughs> me too. Me too. Okay. You know. Um, so I think we're in the minority though, guys. Really? I really do. Oh, Yes. I, I don't know. That's that's interesting. I, I've heard of people using just just sticking a five French catheter and wedging it. Right? Is that what people do? That's yeah. the majority majority wow. of my partners and majority of the partners at my previous institution institution did. Wow. I mean, it is an interesting thought, right? I mean, because I have seen rarely, you know, liver biopsies come back, sort of random liver biopsies come back discordant with really what you think is going on, right? right. Maybe there's like segmental fibrosis, or you know, exactly. Yeah. 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 A good as point. long as it doesn't come back with renal tissue. Uh, so, uh, one last question on work. One bang for your buck. That's right. <laughs> so, in the setting of you know life threatening acute varicose bleeding, you, know, you don't always have time to get your full workup. Uh, and so, you know, what if anything in these patients is a deal breaker? Like, do you have a MELB limit for acute bleeding? Mm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, a question, isn't it? You know, you just you have to take every single one of these cases, um, a yeah. case by case basis, and look at the full picture again. Throw in, you know, is there a possibility to do uh, an obliteration instead of a, mm-hmm. a decompression? Um, uh, but I mean, I think the literature is pretty clear on this that that melds greater than what seventeen yeah, are 18. are prob you know fifteen to what is it seventeen eighteen is that is are problematic. And, Mm -hmm. um, you, again, I think it goes in with the, the whole discussion about encephalopathy and, and things like that. You, you've got to weigh all these risks, um, because, uh, you, they can go into fulminant liver failure pretty damn quick. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, you have to also kind of take into account the, uh, the discussion with the family and their, and their, you know, and to, you know, their values and kind of where they are with the whole process. Their I mean, a lot, a lot of the people I see are, you know, like 30, you know, 30 in this situation, the more urgent tips for variceal hemorrhagers looking at like 30 or 40 year olds, you know, and they right. still got, they have families and, you know, I mean, I think to, to say, no, you know, I can't, I'm not going to do this because your meld is too high. I, I think I, most families that I've come across uh, are, they want something more, even if it's. They won't accept that. Yeah. They, yeah. Sure. They, yeah. They, they wanted to have everything done. I mean, if it was like a 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, whatever, you know, I mean, people have had a full life. I mean, I think that people have a lot different um, sort of approach to that situation than yeah. the younger alcoholics that, that I tend to see at some of the smaller hospitals. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's get into the, the procedural steps for or routine tips. Do you guys do all of yours with general anesthesia? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I've seen them done with moderate sedation, and it's. Yeah, I, I kind of got to say it's probably barbaric. Um, I, I I agree one hundred percent. I have seen it done. There are still uh, attendings at my institution that will attempt them. Mm-hmm. Um mainly because sometimes it's hard to get anesthesia. Um, but I think that's always a, a bargaining chip when you've got, uh, you know, you've got somebody that needs this procedure done. Um, but I, I do think that it's very important. And for, for a couple of reasons, um, one is it, just the general comfort of the, of the procedure. But two is, is you can, if, especially if you paralyze them, mm-hmm. uh, you can slow down the breathing. Uh, so that um, there's there's not as much diaphragmatic excursion, mm-hmm. so your measurements are better when you're trying to uh, lay your tips down, especially if you need to extend the tips. The, it's not moving up and down. Mm-hmm. Uh, same reason why I do uh, um, all my PTCs with general anesthesia, uh, especially if it's a non dilated system. Uh, mm-hmm. You have much much better control over the movement of the liver that way. Mm-hmm. And plus, I don't want my patients to hear me cursing. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, Western Peter, what's your preferred tip set and why? Well, I did train uh, in Oregon, so I am a Rosh Hashida guy. Um, that's my that's my set. Uh, it's my go to. Um, it's very rare that I can't get the job done with that set. Um, Me too, and I don't have it here. Um, oh man, I know it. It's what I'm learning. And, and I th- this set. this is a good point to mention that there's a lot of there are a lot of places that'll have a ring set with a nine French sheath. Yes, man, that is, <laughs> you don't yeah. want to get into the, <laughs> get no. across, get everything set up and then find and then, out you've got a nine French yeah, sheath for your Viator. Viator. <laughs> yeah. So that, so, so I'm a ring guy. Um, I, I was trained using the ring and I've tra- uh, trained all my fellows over the years of doing a ring. Um, I, um, have tried a couple of times to do the, sh- the Yoshida and, my uh, my main issue with that is that um, uh, two things. One, I think it can be hard to get through the liver parenchyma. Um, mm-hmm. it, it it it'll bounce back. It'll it'll mm-hmm. bounce you bounce you out because it's it it is a little bit um, more. It's a lot more flexible of a needle. Um, and two, I've actually seen portal vein dissections. Interesting. Um, with the Yoshida where instead of getting right in into the vein, it actually f- created a flap on the side. And I, I guess you could get that with any tip set, but it just seemed to me that uh, mm-hmm. I had never seen it before in my practice. And then some, um, uh, some new attendings came in that were using the Yoshida set. And I actually saw the, um, you know, I saw, I saw a dissection and I was like, and I could tell exactly where it came from and everything. It was directly, I think, attributable to the fact that the Yoshida just went down the side of the vein and just kind of um, dissected mm-hmm. it as it went down. Hmm. So um, it's funny. I actually used, so I'm not completely against Yoshida. I actually used one in a sharp recanalization and an, and an SVC last week. So wow. there you go. Yeah, I do like the the big cola pinto needle, but it, it's still it's taking some getting used to the ring set. <clears throat> right. What one thing I don't like is the new gore set, and yes. um, I uh, they they have it here, and I have tried at least three times to use it when they have already opened it uh, because they thought another attending was going to use it, mm-hmm. and I I have found that needle to be very flimsy, and. Um, uh, and very hard to direct. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't torque well. The best part about the the Cola Pinto is you got that needle that you can really torque. And a lot of these times when you're close, you you just need to come back a little bit, torque a little bit more, and then go back in. And you really need to have a needle that will hold its shape for that. Yeah. So the issue uh, I, I don't know what Gore said. The first time I used it was there. I I had gone like three or four passes, and I was like, God, how am I not in there? I feel like I've nailed this thing. And I took the set out and, uh, and I, I flushed it. This big chunk of meat came out. It just mm-hmm. it seemed like it, it clogged <laughs> really easily. Um, yeah. And it's just not something I usually think about with those needles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so one, one thing with the, um, uh, with the Cola Pinto that I do is once you've made your pass, you, ha- you get a little uh, syringe of saline and you just flush a little bit to make sure that it's patent. And then after you hook each pass? up after each pass. And Do then you take you, the needle out with each pass. Uh, no, no, no. You're flushing it. So you've made your pass. You think you're in the portal vein before you hook up the contrast and try oh. and aspirate. You just take some saline. If you do contrast, you start getting blobs of contrast everywhere. So you just do saline. Just make sure that you can flush forward just a little bit with saline and then hook up your, your um, 10 CC contrast hmm. syringe and start backing up while you're while you're aspirating aspirating. right until you get because otherwise you may be aspirating and not getting anything and and the the needle is plugged that that may be an advantage to the yoshida so i'm gonna ask yeah i agree yeah yeah Yeah, i mean with the yoshida it's usually just one pass so you don't have to do flushing (laughs) stuff (laughs) maybe that's just an operator thing (laughs) maybe it's you I know, right? I mean, I, I, you know, you guys should understand. I mean, just for full disclosure here, that I'm kind of old school in a, in a few ways. Like, you know, I, I drive a 44 or 44 year old car, and and uh, I like my tip set about as old. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I'm going to, I'm going to ask a, a basic question. Uh, and, and that's when you're getting your sheath down, you know, what is your method for distinguishing between the right and the middle hepatic veins? It's not always mm-hmm. simple. And sometimes the arrow doesn't really fall the way you want. Um, you know, how do you distinguish it? I found a couple of tricks that have worked for me, but I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, I, I think that the arrow does does work well. If you um, one thing that I've uh, started to do with the uh, and and when it doesn't work well is when you have ascites, right? So you've got a big wow, ascites yeah. there, and it's torqued the liver around. Well, I've also found that that will can can create some acute angles in the in the liver as well, mm-hmm. and. Um, so our algorithm, when somebody's getting it for ascites, is we put a you know an eight French catheter in and yep. start draining the ascites as they're you know as while we're doing the procedure. Yeah, we, we do, do too. That very first thing. We do that before I get IJ access. Correct. Yep. And Absolutely. you don't and you want to monitor for bloody Absolutely. ascites. Absolutely. <laughs> or not. Or not. Well, I mean, it never part. happens. Never happens. The, but yeah, the ner- the nurse right, is freaking out over there. It's like, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, I think that if you just, you really only got two options. Again, if you've looked at the, um, if you've looked at the, the imaging beforehand and have a 3d map in your mind before you even go in, you can, you can figure out that, you know, this is coming off a little more anterior. It may be going straight to the right. Um, but it is coming off a little bit more anterior. It's certainly not going posterior. So that's, you know, middle hepatic versus right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's hard to tell when you are in there, uh, uh, without the, the, the tips needle set and you're just in there with your MPA or whatever, whatever catheter. Um, but you can also figure that out by, uh, just angling the beam. Um, and I haven't said this yet, but, um, one practice that has totally changed, um, my practice and my number of sticks and everything is using biplane. I know. I can't wait to ask you why. Uh, yeah. We're going to get into that in a bit, but that, that that's one of the the main yeah. things I want to ask you about. Um, my my number of one stick tips has gone way up since I started using biplane with a with a colapento needle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to use every For trick me, you can get. It'd be hard to improve. Not- it'd be hard to improve on a hundred percent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And for me, you know, if, if I can't tell for sure, just obliquing the tube and just seeing something go toward the spine, uh, right. as something tell me on the right, do you guys do, um, like a, a portogram with an occlusion balloon? I do a CO2, uh, injection from my right hepatic vein before I start tipsing. If I'm not using the ice, right. um, I'll do that. So yeah, for sure. That really you helps. I mean, you? Absolutely. What? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I, if I can't, if I can't get it with, uh, you know, I just basically just take the MPA and, and dig it down in, um, and then do a, a good CO2 reflux. If I can't see it there, then I may go to an, uh, an, an occlusion balloon and do that. And if I can't get it there, then I get the needle out and I dig the needle into the parenchyma and, um, do a CO2 run through the needle. Hmm. Interesting. And, yeah. Cause, and cause it's kind usually... of a graduated way of doing it. I usually do mine right after my wedged, my balloon wedged uh, pressure mm-hmm. pressures. Then I'll right. just then I'll just do a sixty cc uh, CO two, and then overlay that as a as actually a roadmap. Right, right. I'm in the minority. I, I don't routinely do portogram, but um, then how do you know what you're aim, aiming for? Get a good CT beforehand if I can. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you have technology to be able to fu- Do you have um, technology to be able to fuse that? No. Well, maybe I do. I don't know how to work. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I've seen that work pretty well too. I just, yeah, I just use my extraordinary skills and that usually right. gets me through. No, 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 no. So, um, let's see what else. Uh, yeah. You know, with the, uh, the ring set I, I found uh, more frequently, you know, it, it's harder to get the sheep to make the turn sometimes. Do you guys have any tricks to, to get it across a tight mm-hmm. angle? Well, um, with Go my ahead. Yoshida, one one thing that also I, I guess you might mention with the Yoshida, I always always put a bigger curve on my Yoshida. Um, on the needle can, or the sheath? Can, the cannula uh, for the sheath, yeah, yeah. And also for transjugular liver biopsies. I don't know what you guys see, mm-hmm. but it's almost like the angle that comes from the factory is just not quite right. Uh, right. I got to add a little extra bigger sort of radius curve to it. Agreed. Um, yeah, so for, and so for me, my 
typical go-to wire in these cases now is a, 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 actually a Terumo Glide Advantage. Um, mm-hmm. I too. love that wire because all of a sudden you've got a stiff, you know, working uh, wire with a yeah. hydrophilic steerable tip. That has dramatically changed uh, access and tips uh, for me, yeah. at least. I use so, that through my needle too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, um, it's interesting. I don't have that needle. I don't have that wire here at my institution. I used it in my previous institution. It was my go-to dialysis access, um, uh, dialysis interventions wire, uh, Mm -hmm. for the very same reason that you're saying you can cross the lesion, then you have a working wire. Um, and I, I have gone to, um, getting across with a glide and then once the uh, a stiff glide and then once the glides down uh exchange putting down the the catheter for the pressure measurement and for the injection and then swapping over just with the super stiff amplats uh, mm-hmm. i even have gone to um uh Lunderquist wires for that and just don't mess around I mean, you just have a yeah. you have a rail to be able to mm-hmm. hold everything in place so that when you're placing your stent you've, you've got a steady platform so if we uh, had the glide wire advantage, I probably would be using that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an expensive favorite. wire. It's an expensive wire. Well, um, so is Viator. So, you know. <laughs> this is true. So, this is very uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not really thinking about costs when it comes to tips, let's, especially. Let's talk, about, let's talk about pressure measurements. You know, once you've gotten across, like, how do they affect your, your stent selection and dilatation? And, and what values might cause you to pull everything out and call it a day? Um, mm, never quit tips. Yeah. I mean, once you've got access, no, no rarely, gradient never. or, you know, like a bad right atrial pressure. Um, well, okay. Real quickly. Um, I know that there was, uh, it, so one thing that's really interesting is that you learn from your fellows, what your other, uh, attendings do, right? Okay. So we really scrub in with other people. So, um, I learn. I learned that you know some of my uh, colleagues will get a right atrial pressure before they start, and that's their right atrial pressure for the case. Um, mm-hmm. I tend to not do that. I tend to get a right atrial pressure after I'm through. Mm-hmm. Um, take mm-hmm. a pressure. Take a pressure in the um, uh, portal vein, just uh, in the main portal vein, and then pull the the, the tip sheath back and do it in the right atrium. Um, yes. Yeah, same. Same. We've been using that compass device, uh, the digital readout device for the. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have used that for no, pressure. That is. Um, it's oh, I've seen pretty, about that. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about so it. A, well, it's a pretty slick device. So um, I I started using it in children when I was doing opening pressures on LPs, especially on these patients with real high pressures, and you're sitting there and you're waiting for the 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 little fluid to go all the way up your 60 centimeter um Mm -hmm. pipette um so but basically what it is it's a little box plastic box that has a digital readout you hit a button on the side and that zeroes it you can't and then what you do is you hook this in line with your catheter with a stopcock on the back you flush it you turn the stopcock off and now you have a direct pressure measurement uh, in millimeters of, of mercury. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you do that and then you just take that off, um, and, and put it on the sheath and get the same thing. Um, disadvantage with this is it doesn't do, it just does mean it does not do your, uh, systolic and diastolic. So if you're really wanting to know, tease out things, um, you, you mm-hmm. need to use the, the the pressure monitor that you can hook up to the uh, to the to the monitor. Mm-hmm. Um, but these are nice; they uh, and they speed things up. I, I was going to say, is that cost less in time and frustration than trying to relearn your nurses like how to hook up the pressure monitor in zero? That's I mean, where you make up the cost. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, when I started my job, you know, having come from Penn, where the the techs knew how to work that so well. And like that, that was my biggest level of stress with a tips or transjugular liver biopsy was just not screwing up the pressure measurement. Right. Well, um, getting back to CO2, what do you, uh, Peter, what do you guys use for your CO2? You have the, the, the big tank. Um, yeah, you- we, yeah, we have a big tank and just kind of do it old school with some three ways and 60 CC syringes and a flow switch. 
Um, okay. works fast. I mean, you actually have that set up pretty quickly. Um, and you don't, do you have that, um, uh, Navlis set, which has the bag and the three no. uh, syringes and all that stuff? Mm-mm. We don't, we just, again, just hook up directly to the CO2 tank and then flush it out a few times and do a wet hookup with some saline and go. Yeah. We actually we, don't have CO2, so I just blow into the catheter. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really don't. And so, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason I'm not doing poor grams. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. They're, they're, you can do them with contrast, but it, it's much yeah, harder exactly. to do. Um, uh, we had the commander system also before I left my previous institution. We don't have it at my new place, but um, we actually uh, got it because the vascular surgeons were using it for their CO2 uh, PAD cases. And I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's basically yeah. a tabletop. Uh, do you have it? No, I've heard about it. I heard it's great. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful. It takes all of the guesswork out of this. And you basically, you can wrap the whole thing in uh, sterile and you hook up a catheter to it and have a little button you press and you just go and fill up your, your 60 CC syringe and go. And, um, you can do it as many times as you want. Um, it's really, really nice. It's a, um, the, the, the actual devices, you know, the size of a, of a, a VCR or something, I mean, or even smaller than that, just like a, um, uh, 10 inch by three inch box, basically. That's great. Wow. I know the trainees know what VCRs anymore. Uh, that's true. Well. That's true. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, do you use the same target gradient for every case or do you change it up based on the indication? Hmm. Lower for bleeding, higher for ascites. So, Right. Less than less than well, eight, less than eight for me for bleeding, and less than twelve for me for ascites. Right. I try not to get below eight on ascites. Correct. You know, because you're really starting to get into he territory. <laughs> Correct. Um, Correct. So yeah, I I agree. I think and with you bleeding, also, you really got to be aggressive, at yeah, least below all, ten, if not eight. Okay. And one of the one of the issues, especially in the bleeding situation, is the right atrial pressure may be very high from being resuscitated. And so you've got to understand that they're going, uh, you may not get the gradient you want initially, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they they will be diuresed and they, and those pressures will drop um, once, once they've gotten over their acute event, Mm -hmm. especially with a functioning right heart. Uh, So one thing I wanted to cover just quickly, I know we're we're just about out of time. It just, uh, Alternative and adjunctive techniques that you use during a tips. Uh, one, um, when, if ever, are you guys embolizing varices in addition to placing the tips? Well, that's a good question because uh, I've always embolized varices if I see them. Uh, this is how I was trained. Uh, and then someone told me recently that uh, you can't bill for embolization. <laughs> uh, and so, you, you know, and so I don't really care. But if I see big varices, um, I, I usually still embolize them with coils. Coils, okay. Yeah, I used to. So I was taught um, uh, in my fellowship that uh, if you once you were done and you had a good gradient, you had the gradient you want. Now, remember, this is when we were still putting wall stents in. So I'll <laughs> I'll, ca- I'll put that caveat out there. Oh wow! Um, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> um, uh, but um, we would say do a hand injection of 10 cc's of contrast with the catheter in the splenic vein. And if you did not see any varices, you wouldn't embolize them. Um, mm-hmm. If you did a power injection, you're going to reflex up anyway and right. you get false. But we, we felt like that was enough to prove that they were not filling anymore. And, um, mm-hmm. but if you did see them filling that you would embolize them at that time. So I've kind of used that. That's not very scientific, but that's pretty good. Works. Uh, Western Peter, when are you using ice? Yeah. Tell me about ice. I don't, we don't have it. And I, oh. I well, well, it's interesting because, um, I actually trained with uh, Brian Peterson who invented the dips procedure. So it's mm-hmm. kind of a, oh. an early, like 1.0 version of ice. Um, but at the time, you know, we were accessing sort of femoral and jugular, and we we're doing it that way um, for the dips. But with the ice, I've started using it, and it is it is very nice. I got to say, um, I mean, it really cuts down on a number of needle passes. You really can be confident where you are 
where the needle is. And it's just makes beautiful, beautiful pictures. And I think it really is good idea when you are talking about those people, people who have, um, you know, sort of low reserve, they're, they're, you know, coagulopathic, uh, so thrombocyte pink, those sorts of cases. Um, I don't have it every hospital though. So you really have to, you know, be trained on, on the old, old way, uh, using fluoro, I think for sure. Um, and so, so, so I'm not describe, using it every case, but yeah. And I'm not, I'm not familiar with technology at all. It's a, it's a yeah, side yeah. firing over the wire, exactly. um, intravascular ultrasound. Is that correct? It, and what it is a side firing, it's not over the wire. Um, oh, so, okay. um, you put it through a different sheath. So I usually use a second IJ access sheath. I think it's like a nine French. Um, and then, so you kind of steer it. You get it into the sort of intrahepatic portion of the IVC, and then you localize your right portal vein, and then you just sort of you can lock it in place um, okay. and sit it. Now, so then once you're sort of in plane, then you don't have to really futz with the with the ultrasound transducer that much. So some people, I mean, I've been doing it now just sing, you know by myself. I've got to tech the scrubbing and handing me things, you know, for the sure. for the actual. Uh, you know wires and whatnot but but actually once i set it where i want it then then i can just do it myself and it works really well interesting i i can tell you that since uh, since so uh at my uh, i mentioned this earlier previous institution was uh phillips system and phillips biplane at least the ones that we had doesn't have the ability to stand at the neck and Mm -hmm. angle the c-arm um, the APC arm off of the head. Um, mm-hmm. It has to stay directly in front, and then you have your biplane coming in from the sides. Right. And uh, it, that made it nearly impossible to stand there and try and throw a needle because um, mm-hmm. you really need to be at the top of the head to be able to do that. You can't stand at the side. Um, Siemens system has a way of parking it so that you bring you bring it up straight up in front of the head, and then you slide the biplane in and then swing that back out 45 degrees so that you can stand at the head. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't work for all patients because we can't penetrate through the abdomen in some of these patients. Um, That's I've learned that in my IVC filters uh, because I use this technique for IVC filter removal as well. Um, You you literally cannot see anything through these people sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, But we, when you do this, you do a single CO2 run and you do AP and lateral at the same time and you start and you pick where you're going to leave on the vein on the AP, you switch to lateral, you point it towards that vein and you pop. And mm-hmm. it is really amazing how, um, how accurate you can be um, mm-hmm. with, a, with a good CO2 run uh, using the biplane. And that's really been wonderful in, in getting you know, single, single stick tips that way. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea, Pete. Um, cause again, you know, with, I, I cover six different hospitals and one of them has a biplane unit, but no ice, you know, so, right. um, so it's good to have all these tools and techniques, uh, in Absolutely. your back pocket. I mean, it really Absolutely. is one, one, the last thing I was going to say is, you know, with tips is a, it's, it is a really high stakes procedure, I think for us. And, um, and I was kind of alluding to this earlier, but um, any any chance you can get to really teach your staff what you're doing <laughs> ahead of time uh, can really help. I mean, I learned that the hard way and going to some smaller hospitals and, you know, the techs are great, but if they don't see a tips uh, very often, you know, they're going to be a little confused by what you're needing and wanting. And so really knowing your stock at your hospitals, uh, having your, your techs be actively engaged in the teaching process, I think really helps them understand what you're going to need next uh, and allow the procedure to move uh, along quicker. Um, Because a lot of times, you know, these can be long cases. Nowadays, they're not usually. But um, but when they go long, uh, I I think a lot of it can be sometimes, you know, uh, unfamiliarity with uh, the staff with what you're doing and needing. Right on. It's been fun, guys. It has been uh, fun. Thank you both for joining us. This is awesome. What's that? Uh, always enjoy. Always enjoy talking to you, Peter and Mike. It's good to catch up. You too, yeah, guys. I agree. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs>